Okay, well, we got some hot questions this week here for the drive through This first one, Jim, was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Matt James in England. Each week, the Pro Wrestling Illustrated weekly newsletter contained a quiz about a specific wrestling personality. The November 15th, 1993 edition quiz centered on Jim Cornette. How about putting Jim to the test on how well he remembers his own career? And I have the questions <laughs> right here, Jim. Are you up for All this All right. I'm, be- I'm being ambushed here. I'm being bamboozled and flat-footed, but I will, I will attempt. Now, I don't remember. You know, Bill made up uh, some portions of that magazine. Let's just put it that way. But there were also some times where they would ask you for quotes or, or quizzes, things like this, so that I will quickly determine whether this is a work or shoot. How's that? Okay, there's 10 questions. Question one, who gave Jim Cornette his first break in wrestling by hiring him as a photographer? Christine Jarrett. Wrong. The answer, Bill what? Apter. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, uh, <laughs> okay. Question two. <laughs> Who was Cornette's first bodyguard? Um, Hercules Hernandez. Wrong. Big boss man, then what? known as Big Bubba. <laughs> okay. Question three. <laughs> Who fact-checked this? Question three. At what event did Baby Doll defeat Cornette to avenge an earlier loss? Goddamn, uh, 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 constantly uh, for <laughs> the entire summer of 1986, uh, Great American Bash. That's actually correct, at the 1986 okay. Great American Bash. <clears throat> yeah, it just didn't say which one or how many. Question four. How did Paul E. Dangerously anger Cornette in 1987? In 1987. By well, by putting together the original Midnight Express or becoming their manager or worded in some something like that. Very good. By reuniting nope. the original Midnight Express of Dennis Condry and Randy Rose. Question five. What manager once opposed Cornette in a steel cage? JJ Dillon. Correct, JJ Dillon. Question six. And by the way, we drew uh um Oh, God damn it. I used to know, but well, 6,000 people to the, I can't remember the, the dollar gate it's in the book, but, uh, 6,000 people to the Philadelphia civic center for, for the, the fat manager and the, the middle-aged, uh, excellent worker, but nobody knew that manager in a cage, by the way, main event on top. Question Woo! six, which was that the main event? Actually, that was the main event. Wow. Where was Flair that I, night? Um, that was, well, God damn it. If I had time to go get the book, I have the book that has all the, we'll take a break later and I'll, I'll go and see. I don't remember whether he was there or not. I, it, well, I, here's the thing. He probably was there because it was main event because it was cage match. They weren't going to take the goddamn cage down. Question six. Which asshole, which wrestler did Cornet the asshole <laughs> that doesn't say that. Which wrestler did Cornette steal from Jimmy Hart in 1983? Uh, oh, Jesus Christ. Um, Bobby? Bobby Eaton? Correct. Bobby Eaton? Yes. Yes. Actually, uh, well... I don't even really know if we ever did a thing where or I just because the family was so big, I was going out with Bobby a lot then. The first family until he switched babyface. But anyway, I digress. Question seven. And once again, I remind you, this is from, I believe it was the fall of 1993. Who did Cornette prevent from gaining revenge on Bobby Eaton this past March? Um, from gaining revenge on... The Rock and Roll? Arn Anderson. Oh, oh, Arn, okay, okay. I, but wait. They went over. Prevent, I don't know how you prevented yeah. him from getting Yeah, that. they, they, they kind of went over in that map. But anyway, nevertheless, uh, worded unwieldily. Question eight. When and where did Cornette's Midnight Express win its first NWA tag team title? 
February 2nd, 1986, the Omni in Atlanta. Exactly correct. <laughs> Question nine. Who ended the Midnight Express's second reign as NWA champions? Uh, the Road Warriors. Correct. And finally, question 10. Octo- October 30th, 1988 in New Orleans, Louisiana. The most depressing match maybe I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> like the, the match that makes me sympathize with you and the Express more than anything else I've ever seen. Hey, it was a it was a double switch, baby. I think we ended up being better baby face or bigger baby faces than the Road Warriors did heels, just because nobody really wanted to boo the Road Warriors. But we that was the most heat that they had in front of any live crowd during that run. Was that the place to do it? I mean, if you were going to do a double switch or at least attempt it, because again, the Road Warriors were so over as baby faces, it made it hard. Was New Orleans, the place that you would have done it? Um, well, I don't know if I would have picked that specific location if I had any place in the country to do it, but it was a good place to do it. It was certainly better than the Northeast, where you know they cheered the hunter that shot Bambi's mother even back then, or, or some place where the NWA as a whole had no history like out on the West Coast. New Orleans, they were wrestling fans. Uh, we had some history, even though Stan had never worked there still, you know, they knew me and Bobby, the road warriors, even though they had never worked mid South as a territory, obviously had been on national TV for three years. Um, and you know, we were able to do it in such a way that at first the, you could tell at first the people were cheering cause we were getting a shit kicked out of us just from the word go. But then as it went on and the way that you know we structured the thing they started going oh, god damn <laughs> you know wait a, hey hold on what the fuck <laughs> and bobby just with the selling outside and bleeding and trying to get back in and finally blowing me off but being so out of it and you know still tagging in to sacrifice himself for his partner because stan had been two on one you know it, by the end of the thing yeah people got it they were like what the fuck these road warriors are assholes and poor you know midnight express which was the the goal of the thing. Two questions coming out of that real quick before we get to the last one from this quiz. One, how would it have gone over if it had been done in Philadelphia where you won the titles and you were a beloved tag team already? And two, he actually did work in Mid-South or UWF. The Fabulous Ones had a brief run there in the beginning of 1986. Did Stan ever talk about what it was like for him to work for Bill Watts? Oh, well, Stan had actually, he had worked for Bill Watts in, in 79. When when he had broken in uh, December of 78, had a few matches in the Carolinas, he obviously, you know, the Carolinas was loaded with talent. And, oh gosh, uh, Flair put in a word, I believe, with either Mulligan or Murdoch, because Mulligan and Murdoch were running Amarillo at the time. And so Stan went to, and I know this is a long way around this question, but Stan went to Amarillo and didn't last long. Trips were long. There wasn't a lot of money. They went to burn him with the fireball. He got heat with Murdoch and Mulligan. He didn't want to get set on fire. And he got booked in Mid-South. And so, yes, he remembered those long-ass trips. It was better, obviously, uh, when he and Steve went back. They were only there a short time as the Fabs, but he had already worked the Mid-South Territory. So he he was not... I mean, he didn't have anything against Bill Watts, but Stan was not a fan of that territory just because of the fucking crazy people, especially if you were a heel and the and the just long, brutal trips and the schedule. You never got, you know, any time off, especially if you were on top, but even if you were underneath. So so he wasn't really a fan of the territory just in general. And then how would the double turn have gone if it had been in Philadelphia? <clears throat> oh, um, you know, I don't think it would have gone as well because they liked both teams. But at that point, Philly was still or Philly was starting to be more of a, a smart crowd than than, you know, every, everywhere else. And I I think they would have been let down that it wasn't that long of a match and it wasn't competitive. It was a they Pearl Harbored us. You know, the baby faces jumped the heels, right? <laughs> they Pearl Harbored us, put Bobby and busted him open, posted him. And then just two on one stand, and it was more an angle. So I, th- I think the Southern fans were more accepting of an angle situation like that. But that's, you know, Dusty wanted to do that specifically because he knew that, A, he, he, he was about to really put, put 
heat on the road warriors by having them spike him in the eye, which ended up putting more heat on him with TBS than anything else. <clears throat> and he wanted them to be heels. And also he knew that we had already made the deal to bring in Paulie and, and Dennis and Randy. And we were going to be the baby faces in that. So he said, we'll accomplish two things at the same time. We'll get sympathy on the Midnight Express, get the belts off of them to not the way that that was done. It didn't make us look weak. It looked made it look made us look taken advantage of. Um, because a lot of people, well, they fucking just beat him in like six, seven minutes and it wasn't even a contest. You <clears throat> really Bobby's offense and a little flurry by Stan in the beginning was most of the, you know, the, the extent of the offense we got, but it was the way that it was laid out. We were taken advantage of, we were fucked. Therefore they were the heels. We were the baby faces and it, it put us in a position with the fans where we were still strong we were still the midnight express but now we're sympathetic and then here's going to come in the original midnight and going to steal our thunder and this new fucking motor mouthed asshole that you know is obviously trying to be and it's truthfully the way they sold it or way we sold it because that's what it was he was trying in a lot of cases paulie at first to be me <clears throat> but then do his own thing with it and you know it, and I'm not even saying he was trying to do interviews like me, but he was following the Jim Cornette because I was following the Bobby Eaton or Bobby Eaton, Bobby Heenan playbook. But he was, he was, I, now I'm just afraid people are going to say, oh, now Cornette's claiming that Heyman fucking copied him. But no, well, okay. He comes into the territory managing a team called the original Midnight Express with one of the members of the Midnight Express that I managed and is another 25 year old fucking manager. So, and he's doing a lot of the same flavor of shit, but that's what worked because it was like the rock and roll and the midnight express were both great tag teams, but the midnight express were heel assholes and the rock and roll express were teeny bopper idols. But otherwise they were that yin and yang at mirror image. That's why it worked so well. Um, the, the bizarro world versions of each other. That was why, Paulie and I worked because even the people could tell these guys are fucking they're They're the bizarro world images of each other. There's so many similarities, but there couldn't possibly be more differences. It's just, it's, and, and he was the heel because say what you want about Cornette. He may be a prick, but he's our prick. I had the home team advantage. I'd been there. That promo, the first promo you did after the attack, when you came out with the bloody white suit and the crowd was making noise, and you kind of held your hand up to silence them, and they they went quiet. Did were you confident that they would actually listen to you and do what you wanted there? I didn't know they'd do it so quick, and 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 it was almost like it was on cue, like they flashed up the "be quiet" sign. It was perfect. I, yeah. But uh, see, there was no PA system in this. Is what I was telling old Liver Lip Lagana when they set up their tapings, uh, they have to have. <laughs> because that studio is a little bigger, there's there's more people in it. But there was no PA system in in the studio on those TBS shows because it was literally a small enough room and the acoustics in a TV studio are obviously fairly good where you could hear if you were listening. And a lot of times it was great background for the fans to be screaming and yelling while I'm cutting a promo. <clears throat> but in this case... I, I needed them to hear exactly what I was saying so that they would pop on the rest and the go home later on. So I held the hand up because I expected maybe to calm down a little bit. And next I would have said, hold on, hold on. You need to hear this if I hadn't got what I wanted, but it was perfect. So I left it alone. But yeah, that was, that was, it was pretty fucking good. And also in that promo, Yes, there was some elements of classic Jim Cornette there, but that's where I started bringing it back a little bit to instead of just yelling, you know, or instead of just being mad, I started bringing it back a little bit and doing the quieter vow of revenge. It's because that's more babyface. That's not so if I was still wanted to be a heel, I'd have gone out there. And just yelled and made fun of everything, blah, blah, blah. But because I was a baby face or being put in that position now, I still needed to be me, but I can always vary up the inflection or the pace or the volume or the delivery 
to where they don't notice that I'm playing a different part, but they notice maybe the point's made in a little bit different way. And they're like, oh, because now I want them to agree with me. So there's there's different ways you deliver things when you want people to either be mad at what you're saying or you want them to agree with what you're saying. The fact that there was no PA system, how did that affect? I mean, Dusty stopped doing promos in front of the live crowd, right? Well, he did because, see, that's one thing is the the studio crowd was still mixed. You had you had the girls that were going to come because it was Saturday and the guys were going to be in Atlanta for a while and they wanted to get a head start. And and you would see them on the front row and you would have the guys that dressed up as the horsemen in the suits. They would make efforts and camp out, right, or do what they needed to, to needed to do to be in there. But still, remember this was it was free admission and it was first come first served and you you know you had to stand in line so you always got people from that neighborhood especially as you know all the little black kids that could just ride their bicycle from you know two or three blocks away on a saturday morning so you had you had the you know really hardcore smart fans such as they existed at that time the girls that were just you know like i said just there to to get on the front row and potentially wear panties or not um you know, all the kids from the neighborhood and then just some regular people. So it was a great cross section and they all made different kinds of noise. But when Dusty, you know, when he started getting heat with those, the horseman group, a lot of times they could hijack the fucking, you know, studio promo. And, and I mean, whether or not Dusty was doing a, a, in their minds, a good enough job as Booker or not, you know, that wasn't good back then. It rarely happened. Now it happens all the time and everybody just, you know, ex- ex- expects it. But back then it was like, no, I'm just not going to give these guys a fucking chance to bullshit during my promo because that's not the image that we want to send out on television. So he'd do something on tape or they'd show a VTR or whatever. Was he the only guy that did that? Um, well, he's the only guy that could do that. He could decide what he wanted to do, when, where, and how. <laughs> no, but I, there was no one else put in a position where you couldn't put him in front of the live audience because they were uh, trying to hijack. Well, I, the mean, I mean, I mean, you could. It just it 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 took away from it. If he had to go out and do a promo, he would. And if it was something after an angle or whatever, where people are already into that, then they're not just going to switch gears. But he just, in some cases, he would stop just coming out and doing the standard promo like everybody else did. But it just it, it still made him more special. But it cut down on the amount of. Really good promos because, you know, a handful of fucking they they meant well, they wanted to be fucking cool and for the horsemen. But, they it, you know, it just was eh. the final question from this PWI weekly quiz from 1993. Who did the Midnight Express beat for its first U.S. tag team title? Oh, shit. That was the tournament with Garvin and Wyndham, was it not? That is correct. 1987. Yes. The most underrated program the Midnight Express had because no one talks about it. Garvin and Wyndham yeah. who were a you know interesting team to put together, but they were because they were totally different styles. Wyndham was possibly the best wrestler in the entire world. You could argue he was in a yeah. top five, and Garvin was just well. A now badass. you you couldn't you couldn't argue in ring he was in top five. You could argue whether he's number one, but he was one of the five best at that time from you know what eighty four to eighty eight or whatever. Um, and Ronnie was so good, and plus, especially Bobby knew how to work with him so well. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think we got a few matches with Dennis in before he left, and, and Dennis and Garvin was just fantastic because they had styles that meshed really good. Well, that's where it started, uh, but, too. The, the, when you burned Ron Garvin, I think Condry was yeah, still in the team. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Because uh, that was uh, Valentine's Day, the Valentine's Day massacre of '87 in Charlotte. <clears throat> but uh, but yeah, those matches were so good, and it was a night off every night at the house shows because it was just so easy. And plus, watching Bobby and Barry Windham, I've talked about stuff where they they and people now would say, okay, it, it was comedy wrestling and Cornette's bullshit. He's they were doing the same thing. No, they would actually have part of the match. They would do spots with each other on their knees because they were so good that they could do that. But the the difference is the people didn't know that something bizarre was going on and that they were having fun because they made it look natural. The point where if, if fucking <clears throat> Bobby grabbed a fucking 
headlock on Barry and Barry shot him off and followed him close to the ropes and boom, gave him a tackle and Bobby Eaton would fall backwards and sit backwards where he would hit the second rope. His ass would sit on the bottom rope and he would hit the second rope and he would bounce back and fucking Barry would then hip toss him. Boom. And Bobby would roll over and come up to his knees and fucking Wyndham would goddamn drop kick him while he was on his knees. Right. Boom. Now Barry's down. Now, as Bobby rolls over, Barry's getting up to his knees. Bobby comes at him. BW snatches him up and gives him a scoop slam, but he's still Barry's still on his knees when he's <laughs> and boom, and they and they would make it natural as they were wrestling around where sometimes Bobby would hit the the top rope when he hit the rope. Sometimes he'd hit the second rope and still bounce back. It was goddamn amazing. And nobody knew anything was wrong. It still was exciting, but you know, it just it was. They were so good, they needed to make things a little bit more difficult just to keep themselves entertained. I've said it before. I think, to me, maybe the most entertaining time of the Midnight Express and Crockett Promotions was after Starcade up until maybe the late spring of 87 when Stan gets there. Like, Crockett Cup, I love Crockett Cup 87. That match with you guys and the Road Warriors. Because it's just chaos. It's just there's so much crap going on. You tease the fire, which you've set up with the Garvin match. And Bubba's in the mix, and it's just so much happening. Bobby's bumping all over the place. I love that period of the Midnight Express. That was fun, and that was the uh, that was the two night stand at the uh, Baltimore the, the Civic Center then, but the arena now, or what? What is it now? It's named after a convenience store or something in Baltimore. But anyway, that that was a great place to work, and we stayed at the Days Inn right across the street. <laughs> and Sabatino's was was less than two miles away, like a mile away, whatever. It was just, we loved going to Baltimore. 